the U.S. of A. Oh, hurry, oh, the U. Look at the get the get the get the get the The giant marching band, the greatest marching band of them all, is now assembled and down on the field and doing its fantastic, unbelievable, spectacular, stupendous maneuvers. It's the great marching band of all of humanity, led by six and a half billion drum majorettes. In the great marching band of life, friends, are you carrying a tuba or a piccolo? Or are you working your clarinet? Or are you a trombone player? Or are you just a pom-pom twirler in the great marching band of life? Magnificent. You know, I get very, very little encouragement. In fact, almost none. The truth, right? You have my, uh, please, uh, my scary music up there as opposed to... <laughs> or you can better keep that up there because we are liable to need stars and stripes forever quite often because tonight I feel very nervous, Ed, and uh, we just got to keep uh, got to keep a firm grasp on those things. I mean, get, get the scary music up there and we're all ready for... Oh, no, speaking of that, oh, don't, don't, don't take that off, Ed. No, 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 that's all right. That's right. I'm using the... <laughs> <laughs> the rat in the maze technique. I'm going to break that son of a gun down yet in there. You wait and see. I, you know, I've learned that oh years ago in psychology. You just keep that that rat running back and forth in the maze, and you keep changing the cues on him. And before 15, 20 minutes of that are up, and you keep taking the cheese out and putting it the other one, and put the red door in on the green door, and you keep running the lights in, and bing, 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 little bells. Pretty soon the rat is just sitting there on his haunches with his tongue hanging out and his mouth dribbling. You know. <laughs> And he said, all right, all together now, let's go, Ed. Come on, one, two, eins, zwei, hey. To be sung with patriotic fervor. Evangelistic zeal. All right, hold it there. That is tonight's salute to Dick Clark. And uh, we have other goodies coming up for you later on. And now in... Uh... <coughs> Gee, this cheap microphone here keeps getting all bollock stuff. Uh, that's a word that they do not use here in the East, do they? That is an Indiana word. When one is said to be bollock stuff, that, that uh, of course, the Eastern version of that is, uh, I'm bugged. Truly, that's an Indiana for a version of being bugged, is uh, to be bollock. Oh, bo oh, boy, am I bollocked up now? <laughs> it's terrible. Well, of course, that's a primitive civilization, you know. Uh, speaking of primitive civilizations, like I say, uh, I've gotten very little encouragement. Very little. I, uh, it's Friday night, 
and the juices and the terrible surges of vitality and the deep, heady drops of life are just surging through me like gosh awful. And uh, I mean, by George. And so uh, it's very difficult to know whether to sing to bay at the moon, really, or to pick at my cold sore. Or, well, yeah, it's, it's part of life. Don't, don't, don't look away, please. Mondo cane. That means in God we trust, so do not look away. We are here, the captain shouted as he staggered down the hatch. And uh, there are many, many things that must be looked right in the old eyeball of existence. Now, for example, now, I don't think there are little, uh, speaking of looking in the eyeball of fate, I'm, I'm going through the uh, the times, I'm just casually going through it, you know. And here we're, we're all sitting here on Friday night. We can afford to be honest with one another, can't we? I don't know, can we? I mean, let's, let's, uh, is there anyone out there really seriously wants me to be honest? Those of you who do, raise your hand. Well, that settles it. We're going to blast that nylon right out of the water tonight. <laughs> That's a terrible thing we're going to have to do. Now, you're really, you're not asking for that, Ed. You know, you're just talking because, well, anyway, I'm looking through the Times, you know, playing it cool. And the Times is a very serious paper. It's the kind of thing that, that uh, most guys at the Times will tell you that they're not writing for now, they're writing for posterity. So in the year 2750, they'll know exactly how it was. You get the stars and stripes set up in there, Ed, because this is one of the greatest headlines I have seen. One of the great new acquisitions in the city of New York. And there's a headline in the Times that says, Museum here gets a million termites pickled in alcohol. <laughs> After 1,722 crocodiles last year, we got a million termites. <laughs> and you know what's so sad about the museum is it has to pretend that it's very thrilled to get a million termites pickled in alcohol. There's some things, you know, that, of course, uh, it's, it's a sad thing. Many uh, scientists have that problem, too. Uh, it's the string-saving problem. I, I remember uh, Miss Crystal Reeder, my biology teacher, who saved mosquitoes. Somewhere along the line, she got the idea that if she gathered up all the Anopheles mosquitoes in Lake County, Indiana, that she would have a very interesting biological display that could very well win the first-class prize in the biology exhibit in the State School Association's annual fair. And so along with Bruner and Flick and Schwartz, I spent three terrible Saturday afternoons bottling Anopheles mosquitoes and whatever you put Anopheles mosquitoes in, it's very smelly stuff. Now, <laughs> the the uh, the things that man can you imagine how it will be one day when when life has passed from this globe and it's got to come you know it really does it is a fact that the Earth is getting cooler and uh, eventually it will be a dead planet. Now it's it's pretty dead sometimes late Saturday nights around around Philadelphia, but that's just the beginning. Those are indications of how it'll be later on. Now, <laughs> I'm just sorry. I just thought of a Saturday night one time in Philadelphia. I spent that. That's uh, <laughs> oh boy. Speaking of dead beats, well, nevertheless, uh, when this planet becomes a cold, hard, big old spinning ball of taffy apple going through the space through the solar system, and there's nothing left on it except old fire hydrants and used Valentine beer cans. And all the rest of it. Can you imagine? No, can you imagine what a great, big, wild, incredible surprise package it will be when when nobody is here anymore? We'll say it's a million years from now. Nobody's here, and some visitors visit come down from say some other planet, and they're visiting this dead planet, and they land at the corner of Forty Third and Sixth Avenue, and uh, <laughs> they get out. Of course, there's nobody around. I mean, just there's a lot of old Playboy magazines and beer cans and and uh, fire hydrants and you know the whole stuff. It's all just sitting there. It's just sitting there because there won't be anybody to clean it up. Speaking of cleaning it up, if you notice around here in New York City, I don't I don't know whether you guys outside of town have anything like this in your particular area, but New York has a very interesting phenomenon. I have never seen it any place else in in this country. Whenever it snows. It doesn't have to snow very much. Let's say five, six inches. It'll 
piddling snowstorm we had is snowstorm for crying out loud. That was a light frost in Chicago, baby. That This piddling little snowstorm we had here. Everybody's excited and they're running around screaming and yelling and letting work out early and all that stuff. But the most interesting thing to me about it is the abandonment of cars. That immediately when it snows, everybody runs for the hills or for Grand Central or something. And so right here today in New York City, right now, at this very minute, even though uh, there's no snow practically on the streets at all, you're gonna, most streets are clear, most, almost all of them are clear, you'll find in places, in the most unlikely places, like uh, uh, 46th Street between 6th and 7th, or 57th Street between uh, Lexington and Park, right there in the busy thoroughfare, there is a guy's car parked. And they have pushed the snow up all around it. And you can just see the windows. You see. <laughs> he just left it there. It's been like a, almost a week ago. And, and on the TV or the radio antenna, which is sticking out of this little pile of dirty snow, are 37 green summonses. It's going to cost this guy, when he finally bails his 1954 Ford out of the pile, it's worth about $45, by the way, the car. When he finally bails it out, he will have 137.50 in fines. <laughs> and the back end will be bashed in by a city snowplow on top of that. And some guy's reached in through the glove compartment window, you know, and stolen his maps of Indiana. <laughs> I've never seen that any place else. And another thing they do here in New York that, that you won't find much outside of New York, you guys living outside, is, is a trick that guys have in this city I've never seen any place else either. If they're driving along, say, the West Side Highway, and uh, they're going along, or the East Side Highway, even more they do it on the East Side Highway, and they're driving along, and let's say the guy's got a, let's say he's got a 49 Pontiac, you see, and he's gone along, and the bearings are knocking and everything, you know, and he smells the carbon monoxide coming in, and uh, he's just rattling all the fence, and all of a sudden, about 93rd Street, he's going, heading up towards the Bronx, he hits about 93rd Street, boom, 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 Oh, no! And he's got this giant flat on the left rear tire. Well, he jumps out and runs around. Of course, the traffic is going all around him. He jumps out and runs around and takes a look at it, and she has really blown a gimmick. There is pieces of rubber from here all the way back to 80th Street. You know, and you can just see it all over. The old boots and the shoes, and there's a big chunk out of his out of his tube. And there it is. It's down on the rim, and it's all sticking out. So he looks, and he rushes around, and he opens up his trunk. And then he sees five guys have stolen his spare, like last week. It's all going, ah! And he, ah! and he runs back in the car, and he figures he's going to try to make it to 103rd Street on the rim. So he, blah, 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 it's going, blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Well, he gets to about 96th Street and chickens out. He can't stand it. And he's looking out over the hood of this lunker, this terrible car, and the thing is banging and the smoke is coming in. Hey! He stops and runs out, and he kicks at the left rear door and then takes off. He runs like mad. He just leaves it there. It's gone. That's it. It's, it's dead. Gone. It is a dead car. He jumps over the center, that little hump in the center. He tears through the traffic, dives into a little hole in the wall there, and runs up 96th Street. He gets up somewhere near Madison, running hard, see, so that none of the squad cars see him. He hits 96th Street and jumps into a bus heading towards the battery. And on the way, you see him tearing up his registration. He's tearing it up, you know, he's throwing it out. It's not my car. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, uh, that car stands on that street for about... Oh, I'd say for about 12 hours, and, and the, the kids see it, or whatever it is, those, there's, there are scavengers, of course, that they're like vultures. You, you will not see this any place in the country. They're like vultures. They descend on this like mad, and by, by 8 o'clock that night, if he's, if, he's, if he's cut out of that car, say, about noon, by 8 that night, there it is standing right in the middle of the West Side Highway, somewhere they've gotten paving blocks... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they do it. With the cars going past them, and every forty seconds a squad car goes. Somehow they have gotten the wheels off. They have removed the motor. They have taken the fan belts out. They have taken the rear glass out. They have taken the hood off. They have removed the radio, of course, by the roots. Everything's wrong. They have taken the floorboards out, and all that is left is the glove compartment. And they have removed, by the way, the hinges from it. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's kind of, it stands there, you know. Well, about, I'd say if this happens on Tuesday, late Wednesday, a, a Department of Sanitation truck approaches, and they, they, they hook it on the back, and they, they drag it away to the car orphanage. And the <laughs> yeah, they have it here in New York, and they put it over there next to another one. There's a whole acre, the fields of them over there, acres of cars. And what will gas you guys who live out of town is that almost all of them are late models. Some of them are, are, are as recent as 60, 61, 62. Nobody chickens out of a car quicker than a New Yorker when he hears a flat. Or, or what, any, any little thing, gung, 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 he hears that front end going, you know, and that's this, the king pit, the bushings are going, oh, and he jumps out and runs. I don't know, he, he cuts out. And New York has kind of given up on it. They don't even check up on these guys anymore. You know, they, they got the motor number and all that stuff. Nobody checks, apparently each other, they don't check up. Because New York makes a pile of jack out of it. Every six months there is a police auction. And they put all these tanks up for sale. <laughs> Speaking of junk, this is WOR AM and FM New York. Speaking of the chicken, and we have we got a lot of stuff going here. Let's see. I don't know. I didn't intend to do this tonight, but it is really an intriguing New York phenomenon. It, 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 I've never seen it anywhere else. I've never seen anyone uh, more, uh, I suppose you might say, irresponsible than the average New Yorker is with an automobile. He is totally irresponsible. Uh, if you've ever driven a New York traffic, you will know what true, dynamic, uh, vital irresponsibility is. You know, it's a, it's a positive force. It's not a passive thing. You know, guys will go out of their way to belt somebody here in New York, literally. They just like to hear the sound, you know, they want a little, little action. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, listen, I was with a, in a cab driver's cab today. He plays, he plays cab like the, like the, like the Chicago Bears play football. You know, he believes in the game. And, and of course, there are cab drivers who believe in the offensive game, like the Giants are passing strictly. Then there's the defensive cab driver. Well, my cab driver was a defensive cab driver. His trick was to go like mad and then suddenly slam on the brakes and wait for that son of a gun to hit him behind him. See, he's waiting. He goes, ah! Boom, boom, boom. He's out. Oh, you are you. Ah, you are you. And he jumps back. He says, oh, God, I don't want to go. And then we sit there. He's, he's waiting. <laughs> he's a defensive, offensive player. Well, well. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is a summer festival. All right, this city. We're just warming up for the fair. <laughs> I pity a, a, about 98 million people who are coming here for the fair. I'm telling you, there's going to be the golden fleecing. <laughs> they are preparing the chicken plucking machines already. And, and everywhere you go, there are guys with those little green glints in their eyes. And, and uh, many a fair guy, I'm, I'm, I'm sure many a guy is going to get a cab at Grand Central. And the guy will say, take me to the fair. And he'll go by way of Tenafly, you know. <laughs> You take the Great Circle scenic route. <laughs> well, I always wanted to see the George Washington Bridge, and, and uh, <laughs> now, now uh, again, you know, it's funny in this day and age, you, you have to automatically put uh, all kinds of disclaimers and say I'm not talking about all cab drivers. I'm really saying that some weird things have happened to me in cabs. In fact, you know, if I didn't know this town as well, I could have seen a lot of New York just riding in cabs. <laughs> you know, in the little two-block rides, all of a sudden, I find myself... One of the greatest cab stories I heard, though, was, was a cab. He told me a great one. He said that I got in his cab uptown, and I'm, I'm going down 2nd Avenue, which is a very interesting avenue here in New York, and, and it is. It has a distinctive character. Every avenue has a, has a, has a real character, but 2nd Avenue has something peculiarly uh, expressive about it, particularly when you get south of 14th Street. Uh, Second Avenue really begins to make it. Well, I'd say at about 17th Street, it starts to make it. It begins gradually, and suddenly at 14th Street, it starts to really swing. And you get down around 8th and 9th and 10th Street on 14th, uh, on 2nd on Avenue. It, it really, it really, it, it's really going full blast. You get down there in Ratners and Rappaports, and, and you know, <laughs> there it is. Well, well, nevertheless, I'm in this cab. And I'm going down, and, and uh, th you could see this guy is steaming. I could see it. You know, there's a funny thing you get from a cab driver when he's when he's sort of hunched over, and you get that thing. All you see is a couple of ears sticking out. You know, he have one of these furry hats. You see his ears are. 
So I, I'm, I'm, I said, boy, what a day. And then, wow, there's a little snow out there. So you always tell a cab driver it's a terrible day and he'll warm up to you. Because by definition, it's a terrible day to almost all cab drivers, no matter what it is. It's, it's a great, warm, sunny day. It's, oh, damn, it's hot. You're driving on these damn hacks around. It's hot. I'm sweating. Well, all right. So you said, well, if it's if it's a cool day, you know what he says? You, you get into cab, it's a great day. Oh, yeah, yeah it's a great day. What do you mean it's a great day for you? Well, the trouble with a day like this, all the people walk. I got no business. I've been out since 7 o'clock. What do you mean? I clocked only 15 bucks and I made it a rotten day. Well, so, you, you know, you, you, you can always start a great ploy with a cab driver saying, what a rotten day. And immediately he'll straighten up and say, you know, you're a blood brother to him. It's a rotten day. So I'm, I'm sitting in the cab and I say, boy, what a day. Wow. He says, oh, what a day, what a day. Oh, what a, people are nuts. Nuts in this town of people are nuts. Okay. So here we go. I says, what do you mean? That's a very dangerous thing to, to, to prod a cab driver. What do you mean? Well, what do you mean? What do you mean? People are nuts. You know, what do you mean? What do you mean? They're nuts. Well, you can't, you know, can't get out of that one. So I says, what happened? What, what do you mean people are nuts? He says, well, I'll tell you what happened. I'm driving, I'm driving down 2nd Avenue, you know, just like where I picked you up when I'm going along 2nd Avenue. I'm going to, you know, 2nd Avenue has got plenty of traffic. You know, it's got plenty of traffic going downtown. You get all the traffic. It's going all over the place. Well, I'm, I'm going downtown. I get to about 20th Street, see? And this lady hails me. Oh, the women are nutty in this town. They're the worst people in the women. Well, this lady hails me, see? And she says, I want to go to 26th Street. Okay, 26th Street and what? 26th and 2nd. I said, well, okay, lady. So I start to go around the block. You know, it's a one-way street, 2nd Avenue. It's one way downtown. So I start to turn right into 20th. I'm going to go around, see? And I'm going to come back up 3rd Avenue and go. So she says, oh, no, you're not. Now, what are you taking me? I'm not going to pay that dough for going around the block. I want to go to 26th and 2nd. Well. I say, lady, how am I going to get to 26 and 2nd? i got to go around one-way street. What do you think she said? Oh, there are nuts in this town. What do you think she said? I said, no. What did she say? What do you think she said? What I, I ask you now. What do you think she said? Go on, go on, guess. Go on, guess. What do you think she said? I, she wants to get to 26 and 2nd, and I am a 20th and 2nd, and it's a one-way street going downtown. What do you think she said? Okay, what did she say? What do you think that nutty dame said? She says, back up. She says, back up. I said, back up, lady. You mean back up with the traffic coming like this? She says, yeah, back up. I'm not going to pay to go up 3rd Avenue. I'm not going to go up 3rd Avenue. It's going to cost me 50 cents more to go around. I know you hackies. You're rotten bombs. You want to cheat? Back up. Back up, lady. What do you mean? She says, give me your number. Give me your number. Nobody. I'm, I'm paying a, I'm paying a meter. Give me your number. Give me your number. Give me your number. So I give her my number and I says, look, lady. <laughs> Somehow I like the idea of a cab backing up 2nd Avenue. <laughs> That's a true story. By the way, you know, you know, speaking of... Uh, Oh, boy, we better get our commercials here. Let's get the Apple promo, see what's on here. Very is your trombatore. Excuse me, madam. We'll be heard on, on this is the season's seventh live Metropolitan Opera presentation on WR Radio. In the cast will be soprano Leona Timad Pricey as Leonora, baritone Roberto, no, Robert Merrill. Excuse me, I know. Uh, baritone <laughs> Robert Merrill is Count de Luna. That's the Count of the Sun, Moon, isn't it? Anyway, it's Il Travatore tomorrow. Sorry, right. it's very serious tomorrow on WR. Speaking of serious things, we have with us also the pottery of all nations. i got to go down there and get a pot. Uh, the pottery of all nations. Uh, <laughs> that went past everybody. The pottery of all... <laughs> oh, we have nice innocent people living with us. But we have the pottery of all nations, and if you, haven't, if you do not have a pot, uh, uh, the pottery of all nations is down on Sheridan Square. And even you can afford one there, uh, because it's a wonderful discount place, and they have imported pots from all over the world, some very exotic pots of all types, shapes, sizes, descriptions, and colors, and all kinds of uses. Uh, that's Sheridan Square, and they're open Saturday. If you're coming into New York to make the New York scene, make the pottery of all nations scene. They're also at 64th and Lexington in the heart of the high-rent district, and over in New Jersey in the Pizza State at Paramus on Route 4 there. It's the pottery of all nations. And even you can afford a pot. Okay. 
and we're back in business now. All set? Uh, speaking of all set, I, I, I don't know whether I ought to tell you that, because you know, a lot of things, a lot of things today, uh, you know, a lot of people think that Shepard is, is, uh, is anti. You better set up my, my terrible, dangerous, uh, music, that, that heavy, monstrous danger music there. We're going to need it right now. I'm going to tell you about a thing. Now, I've been, I've been trying to hold it down, but you know that at one point, I was the second in command of the ringleader almost. The second in command, really, of one of the very first demonstrations ever held in American institutions of public learning. Now, of course, today, demonstrations in high schools are everywhere. And uh, it's terrible to, to realize that I was one of the beginning ones of, of this whole big thing. Now, do, do you want to hear about it? It was a funny thing. And, and you know what reminded me of it, though, was coming coming around. I was, I, was, I was outside of the station. I suddenly realized that this is almost February. Now, I, I, it doesn't mean much here in New York. But if you were in the Midwest, this time of the year is the beginning of one of the most interesting Pieces of madness, I think, in the United States. It, it really is. A, it, it really is a genuine, uh, a kind of madness. Uh, 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 and when I say madness, I'm, I'm speaking in the sense of the kind of madness that that swept Vienna in the 19th century, the waltz madness. It's a kind of madness that grips everybody to the extent that it is almost if almost impossible to live in certain areas in the Midwest at this time of the year without either being affected by it or repelled by it or in some way completely molded by it. Now, what is that? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's the high school, well, the high school championship basketball madness, which has very little real real action out here in, in New York. And I, I just want to describe something that happens to you, happens in, in, in the Midwest, a very brief description of it, because it's hard to understand it unless you know it. And it is particularly centered in the state of Indiana. Do any of you know anything about the Indiana State Championships? Well, no, seriously, basketball. Of course I'm talking about basketball. It's the only thing that counts. Football is, is not even uh, not even considered big time out there. Of course, they have big time football teams, but nobody really cares. It is basketball that counts. Well, here's, here's exactly the way it works. It is probably the closest thing in America to really Russian roulette. And it's like this. There are roughly 850 basketball teams in the state. Now, that includes real tiny little schools like... Uh, Onion Peel, Indiana, which, by the way, is near Brown County. Honestly, there's a place called Onion Peel, Indiana, and you ought to hear their you ought to hear their their, their school cheers. They're <laughs> great, you know, all 17 students there yelling and hollering. Well, Onion Peel, Indiana, and places like Milan, Indiana, places like Versailles, Indiana, Otterbein, Indiana. Uh, they have they have places like Horsetail, Indiana, places like uh, New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem is the way it's pronounced there. Places like uh, Monon, uh, all these little towns have, every one of them has to the last town, a basketball team around which the town is built, literally built. The basketball team is the theater, it's the literature, it's the culture of the town. And the town is almost entirely populated, Ed, by ex-basketball players. Uh, in other words, a guy, a guy who played, let's say, in 1928 played forward for Monon, is now working down at the Ford, uh, the Ford agency. And he is still a hero in town. They're all heroes in town. They go all the way back to the year one in basketball. Every last one of those guys, they'll point the guys out. Well, there goes Ed McCauley. And you say, who is he? Ed, Ed played guard in 1927. Monon, they went all the way to sectional. Well, <coughs> there's fat old Ed walking down the street, and he still has his high school sweater on. He's got a big M. Well, oh yeah, I tell you the truth, and they live exactly, they live around the high school basketball teams. Now, the reason this is so, one, they can hardly ever afford football teams. These are not wealthy schools, and many of them have very few kids in them. And so the first thing that happens in, in every kid's life, and I, it happened to me, was in the backyard somewhere you put up a basketball bounding board. And the basketball goes day and night, Hot weather, cold weather, in the ice, in the snow. Guys are out in drifts. Boom, boom, boom. They're going, oh, oh, hook shot. Boom, boom. And a pitch. And then it's, it's, it's a life. We have life. Well, about this time of the year, they begin the Indiana High School Championship tournaments. Now, it, it works in stages. 
The first stage is what they call the sectional. That means all the teams in a section will play each other. Every team, little teams, rotten teams, big teams, they do not separate it into classes like they would do in the East. You know, they would say class A, class B, class C, class D schools, depending on population. Everybody is in it together. The little guys are playing the big guys, and boy, you see some wild stuff. So the sectional starts out, and there may be 20 schools in the sectional. There are 800 schools in the whole state that are in this thing. So there will be 20 schools in each sectional. The state is divided into sections. And these schools will play each other over the weekend, beginning Friday night, and it is insane. You cannot... It, if you think it was tough to buy a ticket for the Yankees uh, and the Dodgers last year in the series, forget it. The sectional seats are sold all the way up to the 21st century now. It's impossible. And it's a father and son deal. Because everybody in town played on the basketball teams. Naturally, they get a ticket because they used to be a star. And so, they honestly, they pass their stardom on to their son. So the old guy dies. He leaves his sweater to his kid. And he goes down to the school and gets the ticket. So nobody, nobody outside can get a ticket. And it starts out Friday night. Well, by Saturday evening, there are only two teams left, naturally. Each, a team that is eliminated is out. It's done. No more. The season is over. And, of course, there's fantastic weeping. And then the next team wins. And then the next team loses. And so on until finally Saturday night arrives and the two teams are playing in the sectional, the two teams that are left. And all over the state, the sectional winners are playing on this Saturday night. Everybody's got radios to listen to what's happening down in the, in the Greenport section, what's happening in Elkhart, you know. They're listening all over because it's all kinds. Everybody knows the teams until Saturday night is over and now the sectional winners have won. And, of course, this fantastic celebration if your school is a sectional winner. Then all week it begins to build up, just like a giant boil getting ready to pop. It seethes and it hisses and it gets hotter and hotter. It's like, you know, a terrible thing just getting ready to just be squeezed. Oh, it's awful. And, and people are walking around with a sort of a blank look on their face and nobody's doing anything. This is all over the state. Now we have arrived at the second day, the second weekend, and that's the regional. So, the sectional teams will play each other. Four of them play. Four teams will play. And that's called a regional. So, all the way down the line, you have these different regionals playing. There's, I think there's 16 regionals. 16 regionals. <coughs> and they battle it out. Four teams in each one. And boy, that really is getting hot. Now, what is what really gets exciting, there may be some little tiny team that has 28 people in it, has survived the sectional. It is now playing, let's say, uh, Muncie Bearcats. They have 2,000 students, and they're a powerhouse. It's like the Yankees. It's like, it really is almost like the, like the Yankees playing the Teaneck Little League, you know. And everybody's watching this poor little team out there fighting away. They got nine guys in the school, and eight of them play on the team. You know, the, the one skinny guy with the glasses is handing out the towels. And so, yeah, that's exactly what happens. And so everybody is always for this little guy. Well, of course, Muncie steamrollers them. Boom, pow, they got seven guys that are nine feet tall, and that's it. That's the end of that one. Well, now, after that Saturday night, which is, it, it just gets, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. After that Saturday night, now you have the winner of these regionals. You have 16 teams left in the state. And they're, they're, they're in different parts of the state. It's geographical, see, and they're all, if you can imagine the state, 16 areas, they're all looking over at each other. To talk about civil war, they're all just standing there. And now that boil is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And guys, believe me, guys go, they commit suicide. There are hundreds of suicides every year in Indiana at this time when your team is eliminated. In the last night, Saturday night in the regional, little Brooklyn is all the way down there. And this guy, this big clown from Muncie, sinks a long one-headed shot in the last ten seconds. Ah! And now they go, no, no, no. And they, uh, really, there, there are suicides, fist fights, there are knife slayings, everything right down the last line. Well, now you've, now you've got the, there's 16 teams. Got it? Now, is when it really gets rotten. They have what a, a terrible thing called the semifinals. Now, the semifinals is exactly that. They divide these four, in the four different areas now, four teams play each other, four teams play, four teams play, four teams. You have four semifinal tournaments in four parts of the state. 
And if your town is lucky enough to have a semi, this is always in big cities now, like Indianapolis, Hammond. They'll have a big one down in, let's say, Terre Haute somewhere. And they'll have a great big one down in Evansville. And all over the state, you see, it's a gigantic thing going on. And now they play. They play Friday afternoon. And poor little Brooklands, we'll say, has already, has survived now. It's, it's incredible. Brooklands has survived. And Brooklands comes out the first day and it's playing Fort Wayne. Comes out there in Fort Wayne. Hey, Fort Wayne is a powerhouse. This is all they've won. They won more tournaments than anybody. It's a powerhouse. Fort Wayne is out there, and they, here they come trotting out, big favorites. They come out, and everybody there's a hush in the auditorium. There's 18 million people in there, and poor little Brooklands comes out with its skinny little Sears Roebuck white suit. You know the little green numbers on the back, like thunk 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 thunk, with their Montgomery Ward ball. They come bouncing out there. Ah! Fantastic cheer, and the entire city of Brooklands, all 219 people are there, of course. Every last Model A has come down all the way from Brooklands, and they start blowing horns and yelling and screaming. They're all there, and the mayor is there, everybody is screaming, and, and the whole state is waiting. It's like a hush. And guys have now got four radios, each one stuck in another ear. You know, they're sitting there, and they're getting games from all over the state. And Brooklyn is playing Fort Wayne. And finally, at the last second, Brooklyn is playing this magnificent defensive game. It's got these midgets playing, and they're playing nothing but defensive. They All they can do is hold the ball when they get it and clutch it to them. And, and hope that the other guys don't. They're really little teams play that. They hold the ball, and they stand there. They play a real slow break game. And all the while, giant Fort Wayne is sinking the long shots, and Brooklands is one by one dropping them in. And by George, Brooklyn beats them 17 to 16. Fantastic defensive game. Oh, no, no. Brooklands has won the afternoon game. Well, that night, the other teams play. Let's say Goshen is now playing, uh, let's say Goshen is playing, oh, let's take a big team, Indiana Tech, Hammond Tech. Great big tough crowd, and Goshen it goes down to defeat, and now it is Saturday night. The whole the whole state now there are eight teams left. You see, Saturday night, and they are playing this fantastically important game. Little Brooklands comes out there, and it's really scared now. You can see it's, it never expected to get here. It figured it would be back in Brooklands three weeks ago, you know, at the drugstore listening to the games, and now it's here. It's down here in Indianapolis for crying out loud, and they start playing. Well. That Saturday night of the semifinals is really, it's, it's the equivalent of, uh, I can't, there is no other uh, national holiday that we have that even comes close to it. It is a gigantic buildup, and finally Saturday night arrives and four teams are left. Four teams. Well, you can imagine why guys commit suicide after this kind of tension. Their little team has struggled. Now, remember, out of 800 teams that started, there's only four. You can imagine the astronomical chances you've got of not getting there, no matter how good you are. Okay, if you can imagine 800 teams in the National League, well, it would be pretty hard for the, for the Yankees to win or the Dodgers to win. So now there are just four teams, and they go down to the State House in Indianapolis. They play at the Butler Field House, usually, which is a tremendous thing. It's 16,000 people at seats. Great thing, like the Madison Square Garden here. And, and getting a seat for that, as you can imagine, getting because you, can, you can't buy single-game tickets, as you can only buy the tournament seat. You buy the tournament tickets for the whole scene. Well, it is now the night, the day of the state finals. And the four teams arrive. Well, I'll tell you about seven or eight years ago, a team in, in southern Indiana that was, was so never completely unheard of, a little team working out of a town called Milan, Indiana, on the shores of the Little Maumee, right down by the bend of the Ohio River, had 27 boys in the school. Little, little Milan got to the state finals. It was an incredible... Nobody in Indiana could believe it because they turn out professional basketball. Listen, the guy who plays on a, on a big-time high school team in Indiana is truly... A, he's, he's the next thing to a pro. He really is in, in sports. And, and so here is little Milan. And out of the 27 boys in the school, there were 15 guys on the team. There were about 12, 10, 12 guys on the team. That's it, you know. So he just took half. All right, all the, rest, all, all the rest of you go out. You play football. The rest of you guys are on the basketball team. And they didn't have one guy over 5 feet 10. 
that it was just a tiny team, and they had devised an entirely different set of, of play. They played a. Com they knew they were little. You see, so little they couldn't compete against the big teams. So they played one of the slowest, most maddening games you could ever see in your life. They played truly a defensive game. All they did was hold the ball, maddening. They'd get the ball and they'd dribble for as long. They'd just keep dribbling. They'd work it in and finally this one little guy would boop, he'd whip it in. Oh, the big guys, they, you know, you get tired. I mean, after a while, these guys say, so then they'd start, these little guys are hanging onto the big guy's feet, you know, as they go dribbling down. They're hanging, jumping up, wah, 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 you know, up and down. And, and it was just maddening to see these guys. And they got to the state finals. Milan, Indiana, and of course the other three teams are behemoths, you know. They, they come from the big schools with 4,000 students, and they have the nine-foot centers and all that sort of thing, and nobody considered Milan anything. And so that afternoon, Milan played one of the great big teams, Indianapolis, I believe it was Indianapolis Short Ridge, who was a genuine favorite. Well, Milan beat them. By one point in the afternoon, one of those sneaky little games like 42 to 40. Milan won, and the, town, the whole state went out of its skull. Well, that evening, Milan is playing now. The other teams played, and Milan is playing in the state championship. Well, Milan, Indiana played that night. And of course, nobody believed Milan would win. It was just ridiculous. It was just, it was like a, a crazy dream. They'd go all, all the way up through. Little Milan, Indiana went into that game, and by halftime, the score was 17 to 16. They were playing such a wild defensive game. And little Milan, Indiana was struggling all the way down until finally the last 30 seconds, Milan is trailing 30 to 29. And these little guys can't get the ball from the big guys. And suddenly one of the big guys fumbles. A little guy gets it. They pass back and forth, madly, madly. And the whole state is watching back and forth. Back. They're holding the ball. The clock is ticking. Eight seconds, seven seconds, five seconds, four seconds. When suddenly this little guy, whoop, up goes the ball. It bounces, whoop, whoop, in, boom. Milan, Indiana won 31 to 30. And the whole state stood there. And suddenly, just like a giant scorpion pulling itself together, the state pulled into an enormous demonstration. There were 37,000 cars, literally, that left Indianapolis for Milan, Indiana. Millions of cars began to descend on this tiny town on the banks of the Miami River. Until finally, by nightfall, it was estimated there were over 120,000 people in town. This tiny little thumbprint. And there were nine guys walking around, these little squirts, hanging out on a basketball. We're not going to get it. Hanging around. Milan, Indiana, of course, has never been heard from since. But what a fantastic moment in the history of American sports.